Michael Burry recently released his latest investments, and behind me is his full stock portfolio. Now, Dr. Michael Burry, as you likely know, was one of the fund managers who predicted the financial crisis and profited from it greatly, a story that was portrayed in the popular movie, The Big Short. However, despite his past success with his firm, Cyan Asset Management, until recently, his current investments were unknown. It wasn't until Q4 2018 that we got the first 13F filing in over two years, to finally get a glimpse into Burry's mind and portfolio. Fast forward to today, and now we have access to, behind me, his most recent Q1 2019 13F filing, which shows his latest investments. In this video, we'll be doing a portfolio review of Cyan Asset Management's 2019 portfolio, covering Dr. Michael Burry's holdings, stock trades, and portfolio performance. Before we jump in, take a second to make sure you're subscribed to gain access to more content like this in the future. So this is Michael Burry's portfolio, at least as of the latest 13F filing. A 13F filing to the SEC is required by funds who are managing assets of over $100 million or more, and is a snapshot of all the long stock positions and any put or call options that the fund is invested in at the end of the reporting period. In this case, the reporting period ended March 31st, 2019, so we know that as of that date, Michael Burry had long positions in each of these stocks. However, what's not disclosed in 13F filings are any short positions, so it should be noted that he may have a few direct short positions or bets against a stock within his full portfolio that's not necessarily disclosed here. What's interesting is that compared to last quarter, Dr. Burry has made an adjustment to every single one of his stock positions, whether that's initiating a new position in a stock previously not in the portfolio, selling off a position entirely, or adjusting his portfolio sizing, buying a bit more of some stocks, and selling off a little bit of others. We'll discuss each of these portfolio holdings a bit more in individual detail later on in the video, but for now, we'll give a quick overview of his holdings. At the time of filing at the end of March, the largest position in his stock portfolio was the Chinese e-commerce site JD.com, which made up a little over 9% of the total portfolio. This is actually a new position that was purchased in the first quarter of 2019 and wasn't in his portfolio the quarter before. The next 11 positions were all positions that he had in the fourth quarter of 2018, but he has adjusted the portfolio sizing of them. His second largest position is Five Point Holdings, a real estate investment trust. Third largest is Alphabet or Google. Fourth largest is Altaba, which is now an asset management company or the remains of what was Yahoo. Fifth largest position, the Walt Disney Company. Sixth is Facebook. Seven, Cleveland Cliffs, an iron ore mining company. Eight, Core Point Lodging, a real estate investment trust. 9. Western Digital, a digital storage company. Numbers 10 through 12 are troubled retail stocks, specifically tailored brands, GameStop, and Sportsman Warehouse Holdings. The last two positions are new additions to the portfolio, Green Sky Incorporated and Pet IQ Incorporated, which are both small cap companies. In addition to that, Burry sold out completely of five of his previous positions, Alexander and Baldwin, a real estate investment trust, three healthcare stocks, Biogen, Celgene, and McKesson, as well as Mohawk Industries, a home furnishing company. Taking a quick look back at his 2018 portfolio, there are a few themes we pointed out in the last portfolio review. Namely, there is a portfolio concentration in real estate, a potential investment in digital content with Alphabet, Facebook, and Walt Disney, a contrarian bet investing in struggling retail brands, as well as a smaller portfolio position in some healthcare stocks. You can see the breakdown here, but I'm happy to say we have much better graphs this time around. So for this quarter, I wanna first take a look specifically at the portfolio holding changes. Now, the way this chart works is that red highlighted sections represent the percentage of the portfolio that that stock held in the previous quarterly filing. The blue bar represents the percentage of the portfolio that that stock holds now. So effectively, these empty red bars are positions that were completely closed out during this quarter, and these lone blue bars plus JD.com on the left represent completely new additions to the portfolio. So with this graph, you can see where there were changes to the overall portfolio weighting each stock component had in his portfolio. Aside from the positions he sold off and the new positions that he's added, some notable changes include Western Digital and Altaba, where their portfolio allocations have roughly doubled. This comes in part from price increases during the first quarter, as well as relatively significant additions to the number of shares of each of those companies. There was also a reduction of portfolio weight to core point lodging, driven by Burry selling off a portion of his shares, and also a reduction to the proportion to tailored brands. However, this reduction of portfolio weight to tailored brands wasn't due to Burry selling off the position. On the contrary, if you look at the trading activity for the quarter, Burry actually increased the number of shares in tailored brands by over 36%. The reason the portfolio weight has decreased so much is that tailored brands has seen a very significant stock price decline. 
As for sector concentration, the blue bars in this graph represent the sector concentration of the S&P 500, generally representative of the U.S. stock market. The yellow bars represent Burry's allocation to each sector last filing, and the red bars represent this current filing's allocation. Burry's portfolio is overweighted in communication services, which include Disney, Facebook, and Alphabet, consumer discretionary, as well as real estate and to some extent minerals as well. So compared to a general index fund or S&P 500, Burry has less or no exposure to some of the other sectors. For instance, having no allocation to consumer staples, energy, industrials, and utilities, and an under allocation to financials, healthcare, and information technology, at least compared to the index. Now, is this a bad thing per se? Not necessarily, but it is different. And part of the reason for that difference is likely due to Burry's investment philosophy. This is a quote from his 2001 shareholder letter, which I think encompasses this relatively well. As much as the fund is a value fund, it is an opportunistic fund. And as much as I enthusiastically explore the value of each business behind every stock, I seek the pockets of the market that are the most inefficient, the most temporarily imbalanced in terms of price. Whatever extra return this fund will earn will be born of buying absurdly cheap rather than selling dearly smitten. I certainly have proven no ability to pick tops, and I do not anticipate attempting such a feat in the future. Rather, fully aware that wonderful businesses make wonderful investments only at wonderful prices, I will continue to seek out the bargains amid the refuse. So going back to the sector concentration graph with this context in mind, we can get a sense that Burry as a value and contrarian investor believes that his stocks in certain sectors are trading below their intrinsic value. This might help explain some of the sector concentration, as many times it's not just a single stock that is down, but an entire sector that is perhaps trading below its historical averages. Now, Michael Burry is certainly smarter than me, and I would probably bet most of us as well, but that alone doesn't guarantee outperformance in the stock market, especially in the short term. Given the end of the reporting period on March 31st, we can get an idea of the portfolio performance that Burry has seen since that time up until now. Unfortunately, it hasn't been great, and we'll explain exactly why in a second. If I hide myself, we can see that over this period from the end of March to today, June 6th, Burry's portfolio, assuming no other trades were made, would be down 10.5% over this period, which compared to the S&P 500 index over that same period of time, was up 0.4%. Effectively, what that translates to in real dollars is that Burry would have lost roughly $10 million of his initial 98 million portfolio value at the end of March. If he had instead invested in the S&P 500, he would be looking at about roughly a $400,000 gain instead of a $10 million loss. Now with a contrarian investing style, your returns are going to be different than the market. Sometimes they will be higher and sometimes they'll be lower. In this case, let's break down the performance of Burry's holdings to see exactly why there was such underperformance during this period. With that, we'll take a look at this chart of holding performance. The blue line represents the value of that stock position in dollars when Michael Burry filed his 13F filing. The red bar represents the current dollar value of that position in the portfolio. Red bars above the blue line represent a gain and red bars below the blue line represent a loss. The magnitude of that gain or loss is represented by the difference between those two levels. First thing you'll notice off right away is that there are not too many bars that are above the blue line, meaning that there are not too many individual stock positions that have gained or appreciated in value over this time period. On the contrary, the majority of the positions have actually incurred a loss over this period, some of which were of relatively high magnitude the largest loss coming from the stock of GameStop, which of course we'll be discussing more very soon. But first I want to show you this other graph, which is an alternative visualization of the same concept. If you haven't seen this type of graph before, this is a waterfall graph, effectively tracing the cumulative total portfolio performance by adding each stock's contribution one step at a time. For instance, JD stock alone contributed to 1.2% of the total decline of the portfolio. Five Point Holdings, on the other hand, had a positive contribution of 0.4%. Google contributed minus 0.1%, Altaba minus 1.4%, and you can follow along and see how each stock contributed to the performance. Now these stocks were ordered by the position size at the end of March, with the largest initial positions at the left and the smaller portfolio positions on the right. Returning back to the waterfall graph, one thing you can take away from this information is that the majority of the losses came from the smaller positions in the stock portfolio. And within those smaller positions, 
The largest losses by far came from one specific sector, which was the consumer discretionary, specifically the troubled retail stocks, tailored brands, GameStop, and Sportsman Warehouse Holdings. Those three stocks alone contributed over 70% of this 10.5% decline. Had those retail stocks been excluded from the portfolio, Michael Burry would only be looking at roughly around a 3 to 4% loss instead of a 10% loss over this period. The magnitude of this loss for Cyan Asset Management is relatively stark when compared to the S&P return over that same period. So now that we have a better understanding of Burry's portfolio and holdings, let's take a look at some of the individual stocks and add some commentary on them. Specifically, let's start off with the elephant in the room, which is GameStop, which was probably the most controversial stock in his portfolio, which turns out was for a very good reason, as it's the largest loser of the portfolio. Full disclosure, I had previously owned shares in GameStop as well, which I assume was for likely the same investment thesis. GameStop as a retailer primarily of physical video games and products, doesn't really have a lot of longevity in an era where most of that industry is going digital. That being said, if management recognized that this is a business in terminal decline, they could and should use the remaining relatively significant cash flows the company is still currently generating and return that value directly to shareholders. This would be in the form of either dividends and or share buybacks. Had GameStop taken this route, shares could have reasonably been valued at $14, much of that expected value coming from dividends as well as revenue from the next console release cycle. Instead of taking the most logical and simplest approach to providing value to shareholders, New management decided to take the completely opposite approach. Not only did they completely cut the dividend, but they say they have no intentions of buying back any shares anytime soon. Instead, they're likely to use the cash on initiatives trying to spur growth, which unfortunately, if history is any indication, has not turned out well for GameStop. Given that poor management was still a risk, I sold the majority of my shares in Q1 after the buyout negotiations failed, but still retained a small portion of shares up until the latest earnings report, which have since been liquidated. Now for me, the investment thesis for GameStop is gone as it's clear that management has no intent on running the company in the best interests of shareholders. It'll be interesting to see if Michael Burry comes to the same conclusion or if he continues to further add to his GameStop position, which he did last quarter as well. Either way, it'll be interesting to see a few months from now if we get that 13F filing again. Tailored Brands, the holding company for Men's Warehouse and Joseph A. Banks, is another retailer that is certainly struggling. Well, on paper, this stock looks ridiculously cheap, trading at a price to earnings ratio of effectively four. I've been avoiding Tailored Brands specifically for two reasons. One, the company simply has too much debt to really be comfortable with as a shareholder. This debt was incurred when Joseph A. Banks and Men's Warehouse merged, and as typical with most mergers, shareholders rarely win. If you take a longer term view of the stock price, it's hard to believe that this is a stock that was once trading over $50 now that it's near trading at five. Unfortunately, that's what overpaying for an acquisition can do to a company, straddling the company with debt that limits returns for future shareholders. And the second reason I've avoided Taylor Brands is because of their CEO. Again, a similar lesson learned with GameStop, don't trust bad management. Now, Dinesh Lati was appointed to CEO March 28th, 2019, but he's been a member of the board of directors on Tailored Brands since 2016. His past record of executive experience, well, let's just say it's not great. You probably want to leave this one off the resume. One King's Lane was an online home decor business, which was quickly growing and valued at $440 million in 2013 with over 10 million members. In 2014, the company was valued at roughly 900 million, and at that time, Dinesh Lati was appointed as CEO in April of 2014. Fast forward just two years later, and the company was ultimately sold to Bed Bath & Beyond for $12 million. In his short two-year span of CEO, he was known for effectively and meticulously destroying 98.7% of the company's value. Now, based on that track record, he still has a little bit of ways to go for tailored brands, but I'm not going to be there as a shareholder to find out. From Burry's perspective, if the company is able to continue to pay down its debt before the next economic slowdown, they do have a chance of recovery. However, should we see an economic slowdown that impacts earnings to the point where Taylor Brands is struggling to make interest payments, then shareholders are likely to get the short end of the stick. JD.com as his largest portfolio position certainly shows some confidence that Burry has with the stock and the company. The stock reached a peak a little above $50 in early 2018, is now trading for roughly half of that. 
It's trading at a high price to earnings ratio, but a relatively more modest forward price to earnings ratio, implying an increase to profits earned next year. Trade negotiations might be putting temporary pressure on the stock, which could be relieved once those negotiations are complete. But then again, there's no guarantee on exactly when or if that is. So it's hard to really incorporate that into an investment thesis. Personally, I'm not quite as familiar with many of these Chinese companies, but JD.com would appear to be a continued bet on the growth of e-commerce, particularly in China, as it's one of the main dominant players in that space, along with, of course, Alibaba. Recently, Google and Facebook are a couple of the companies in the sight lines of the government specifically for antitrust cases. These cases arise when a company gets large enough that they effectively have a monopoly on a certain industry, which is detrimental to consumers. Well, this certainly may continue to put pressure on the stocks in the short term, I don't really see this as a long-term issue. Specifically, since both Google and Facebook provide their services to consumers for free, there isn't really a strong argument to be made that this is detrimental to consumers. I don't use Facebook's products, but I do use Google's products every day, and my life is certainly a lot easier because of it. We'll see what happens and develops over time, but it'll be interesting to see if Burry views this temporary decline as a short-term opportunity to increase his position in each of those stocks. Five Point Holdings and Core Point Lodging are the two remaining real estate positions in the portfolio, both of which were at or near the prices they were at, at the end of March. One company that Burry did benefit from though was Disney, which saw a significant price appreciation with their announcement of their Disney Plus service. The price point of Disney Plus was much more aggressive than most people were anticipating, indicating Disney's likely intention to make it a much more serious competitor to Netflix as a primary streaming option for consumers. Since then, Disney stock has seen a rise in price to earnings multiples as investors are anticipating higher growth from the service and are willing to pay more for the stock now because of it. It'll be interesting to see how Burry decides to manage his position size in Disney, given that some of the upside of Disney stock has now been realized. Green Sky is one of the new positions in Burry's portfolio this quarter, and it's also a relatively new stock in general. The company provides point of sale financing and payment solutions to merchants, customers, and banks, but the company was only incorporated in 2017. One potential concern with the company though is that it's highly leveraged. This can mean even if there is the potential for future growth, they have to be a bit more careful and have less financial flexibility than other companies with lower debts and more cash. Point of sale financing solutions, which the company provides, might see more growth if merchants and consumers value the ability to spread out their payments through financing for a purchase. While it's hard to say if this would exactly pan out, there may be a small degree of recession resiliency in the sense that when times are tough, more consumers and merchants would opt for financing as opposed to making payments in full. On the other hand, you could argue that the total decrease in volume of transactions would likely be a net negative to the company. As it's a new company, there's not a lot of history behind it, so we'll have to see how it plays out. Pet IQ is the other new position in Burry's portfolio, a manufacturer and distributor of veterinary products and medicines for pets. The company was founded in 2010, but it's actually a relatively recent new stock as it IPO'd in 2018. It's currently trading at a relatively high ratio to its current earnings, but those earnings are expected to grow in the future as the company brings in more revenue, which will more than offset the fixed costs that the company needs to operate, which should increase earnings at a rate faster than revenue. With year-over-year -year quarterly revenue growth at almost 30%, this looks like a fair possibility. A benefit of Pet IQ is that it's operating in a healthy market. The demand for pets, and hence healthcare products and medicine for pets, has been steadily increasing over the last decade, and that trend is expected to continue. Part of this trend may be driven by the fact that as younger generations are waiting later and later to get married and have kids, they're supplementing their household in the meantime with pets. In addition to that, pet owners are becoming increasingly more conscious of pet health, which has led to a general trend of increasing pet spending per pet. This thesis might take some time to play out, so it'll be interesting to see how long the stock remains in Burry's portfolio. Overall, I hope you enjoyed the video and got some insights from Burry's portfolio. If you got value and enjoyed this video, leaving a like on the video is a great way to show that and lets me know which videos you guys enjoy most. If you have any suggestions for other investors you'd like a portfolio review of, you can leave that in the comments or other videos you'd like to see as well. Until then, thank you so much for watching. My name's Michael and I will see you in the next video.